Here we go, it's Dillinger escape plan time, baby. Everyone knows that the rhythms are pretty crazy, but in this video I'm going to argue that some of the stuff they do is even crazier than people seem to think, with an example from Prancer that I've spent a significant portion of my life listening to. A general consensus for thinking about their rhythmically chaotic sections is that they're built up of fast twos and threes alternated without an overall pattern. This is definitely true of a lot of sections of their music, like this section from Panasonic Youth. <laughs> The first riff from Prancer is also like this, though it's a little slower and it's not just twos and threes. But the idea is the same. There's no overall pattern to how these different lengths come one after the other until we get to the end of the, the riff section and the whole set of them repeats. that's pretty chaotic. There's not really any simplifying way to come to terms with this. You just have to memorize how it goes, although this is a pretty short example of this. But as a way of introducing the even more chaotic thing they do, let's start with a mystery. Here's the section I'm going to talk about. Here are three transcriptions of it that people have done. One is from the ultimateguitar.com user Lursh. One is from the official tab book from the album transcribed by Sung Joon Park. other is by Jose Garza, a fellow metal academic further along in his career than I am. There are significant differences between these three tabs for this section. They can't even agree on what the tempo is. Their transcriptions of most of the rest of the song, on the other hand, are pretty much identical. So what's the deal? I'm going to say that the problem is that the whole premise of these transcriptions, that the section can be transcribed on a metric grid at a single tempo, doesn't reflect what's actually going on. In other words, none of them are right because the band is playing off the grid. I'll explain why I think this first, then what it might mean. But first, I hope this kind of intuitively makes sense. It feels like most of this is pulseless chaos. <laughs> until everything lines up with those parallel major sevenths, which kind of bring the pulse back in, in between these, these chaotic chunks. So when I say the tabs are wrong, I need to be more precise. Most people use tabs to learn to play something on guitar, and all three of them would work fine for that, as long as you're not trying to read the rhythms on them literally. What I am saying is that if you translate these tabs into claims about how long each note should last, they'll be different enough from the recording to make a difference. Lucky for you, I've already done this, so you don't have to. It's simple enough to translate the tabs into a table of numerical values. If the quarter note is around 155 BPM, as the official tab book says, then we know that each quarter note lasts for 387 milliseconds, each eighth note lasts for half of that, etc. I've numbered all of the attacks in the transcription so that I can compare them to each other and to the recording. Then I looked at a spectrogram of the section and measured the times between each of these attacks, which is called the inter-onset intervals. It's relatively easy to do this precisely because the kick drum attacks, which are synced with the guitar attacks, show up pretty clearly on the spectrogram as these gray lines, and the software will measure the time between markers I place for me. From there, it's straightforward to compare what time values each of the transcriptions predict as opposed to what actually shows up in the recording. There are plenty of interesting differences here. I think the most striking one is comparing the first couple attacks. 
the proportions for even the first few of these are dramatically different in all three transcriptions. The numbers from Garza's transcription are the closest to the actual recording, but he gets this by saying that the passage has two stable tempos instead of just one. But the bigger picture thing I'm arguing is that no rhythmic transcription at a single tempo could work for this. Even Garza's transcription has some significant differences from the recording. I'm skipping over some steps here, but I think of this section as non-pulsed because the lengths between attacks and the actual recording are continuous. If we were to have something with all attacks on the grid, we'd expect them to be quantized. For example, at 155 BPM, and assuming that the small subdivision would be a 16th note, we'd expect to see clusters around lengths that are multiples of 97 milliseconds with some small margin of error, something like five milliseconds or so. Instead, what we get when we list all of the inter-onset intervals for this section is that it's pretty much continuous. Even if we do our best to cluster them, the common pulse ends up being faster than what most people can hear as having a specific rhythmic identity. There's lots of research that shows that for most people, the fastest that they can do this, that is use a stream of pulses metrically, is with attacks lasting around a tenth of a second, which sounds like this. So that's fast, but I could group this into twos and threes and form a string of attacks if I practiced a little bit. Garza's transcription would require groupings at around 79 milliseconds, which is significantly faster than that threshold and sounds like this. which I certainly can't use to undergird metric distinctions. It's so fast that the pulses start to blur together. Maybe Billy Reimer can do this, and maybe I could if I practiced it a ton, but even then, most people wouldn't be able to hear it this way. And so Jose Garza's transcription is already, I think, kind of fundamentally unplayable, and the recording is actually, if we were gonna say that we had to be hearing at a single tempo, it would be even faster than this. So what does all this mean? Basically, I'm arguing that in this section of Prancer, and a lot of very characteristic sections like it in the Dillinger Escape Plan's music, gone off the grid, or even if the band is still hearing this on a very fast and precise grid, which I think is kind of unlikely, it's so fast that the vast majority of listeners will not be able to hear this grid with them. This is kind of a subtle point. I'm obviously not saying that these rhythms are too fast to be played because the band plays them, and I'm going to play them myself. Instead, I'm saying that in order to play them, I'm not putting them on a mental consistent grid. I'm kind of just brute force memorizing how long each attack lasts and reacting to the recording as it happens, which is a very different experience than how I learned to play most complicated rhythmic stuff in metal. This is why I had so much trouble trying to learn the song by slowing it down and reading the rhythms from the transcriptions. That works for almost all metal stuff, and even works for most of the Dillinger Escape Plan stuff, but it falls apart here. Instead, you have to learn these chaotic rhythms as like absolute durations, and then figure out how to sync them up by playing a lot with the recording, or if you're the band, playing with a specific group of people. Wilson has said that they didn't always play or record with a click track. This seems to be one of the times when they don't. I also think this because live performances of Prancer are slightly different from each other and from the recording, which is pretty different from if you go and see Meshuggah or Between the Bear to Me and everything sounds pretty much exactly like the recording. <laughs> Hey! 
Performing off the grid certainly isn't impossible. I've been able to pull a section like this off with just a few months of practice with the band. There are also some clear non-pulsed sections in the song even before this point, in the intro burst and the unmeasured pause after the first riff. So, as best as I can understand it, my guess is that this section probably started out as a very fast version of the sort of thing that I started this video talking about, where it's just twos and threes alternated without any real pattern. But through rehearsal, it evolved into this thing where the tempo is kind of pushing and pulling, or maybe they're no longer even feeling a beat at all, which makes it all even more chaotic and intense, and it makes sections like these like my favorite thing about the Dillinger Escape Plan's music. I'll finish with a little metaphor because they can be fun. One of the most famous things about the Dillinger Escape Plan's music and live performances were the willingness of the band to cross traditional boundaries. Greg and Ben especially would be all over the room, in the crowd, hanging from the ceiling, jumping off stuff, knocking things over. I think that this off-the-grid stuff is part of the same tendency for the band to be wherever they want, whether that's physical spaces in a show, metaphorical spaces with respect to genre and harmony, or metaphorical slash visual spaces in the sense of rhythms within a bar and in relation to the grid. Anyways, thanks for watching, and if you like my videos, I'm sure you know which buttons to press to show it. You're smart folks. See ya.